Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I'm the president of Ubiquity University. And I'm delighted beyond measure today to welcome all of you from, we understand it as of now this morning, from 42 countries around the world. Over 300 people have signed up uh, for, for this course uh, from 42 countries. And we are deeply grateful. And we thought that a good way to start would be to just provide a context for what is actually an unprecedented event. You're joining the first course in the reinvention of the MBA, a master's in regenerative action. As far as we know, there's no master's program, no MBA program anywhere in the world that's dedicated to regenerative action. Uh, and so we want to honor all of you who are joining this historic moment, uh, which we are launching with the fundamentals of donut economics. I want to just provide a few moments of, of context and history because it is uh, been about a year uh, in development. Uh, last year, uh, Ubiquity University and uh, over 350 partners uh, from around the world launched Humanity Rising in the depth of the pandemic as an opportunity on a daily basis uh, for people from around the world to come together and share experiences and visions. And one of the people that um, I met through this process, uh, who I'll introduce in just a moment, was Ed Muller, uh, the president of the University of International Cooperation uh, in Costa Rica. Uh, and in our first conversation, he said to me something that changed my world. He said, Jim, it's no longer about sustainability. Sustainability is obsolete because you can't be sustainable with a degraded environment. Human beings have to replace sustainability with regeneration, regenerative action. And that's the only recourse we have left as scientists from around the world are telling us that we're literally running out of time to address climate change and a range of other challenges that are gripping our world at the heart of which is the degradation of upwards of 70% of all the biodiversity uh, on our planet. So that hit me like a diamond bullet. I knew it was true. And we reframed humanity rising around the meta thematic of regeneration. And it was in conversations with, with Ed and Kate Rayworth and uh, Joel uh, Carboni at uh, the Green Project Management, who came in as an instant uh, and senior partner uh, to the development of the MRA that pretty soon had scores of organizations from all over the world that said, yes, let's come together and reinvent the MBA and start a master's in regenerative action. So we've been working together for over a year to get to this moment. And it's a profound moment of ignition of a meme in partnership with people working on regeneration all over this planet uh, to provide uh, the learning pathway, starting with Kate, uh, for what people need to understand about our world. Uh, and it's been linked, uh, our MRA, uh, to different bioregions around the world, uh, different cities around the world, uh, you probably all heard that uh, Amsterdam last May made a commitment to embrace donut economics beyond the pandemic. Um, and so we're developing a master's in regenerative action that links knowledge about the world within the frame of regeneration with action in the world to shape the human future so that it can be regenerative and thus abundant and healthy and most fundamentally in alignment uh, with natural systems. Uh, so thank you everybody for uh, joining this course today. You are making history. We 
are making history. And so I want to just acknowledge, uh, uh, Ed, uh, your uh, bringing in the regenerative theme into humanity rising and into ubiquity. Uh, Ed has been a, a close uh, uh, daily partner uh, in the cultivation and development uh, of this MRA. Uh, so Ed, um, welcome and uh, please say a few words. Thank you, Jim. And thank you for being so passionate about uh, going on this trip uh, with all of us together. And thank you for all of you who are in this course. And I hope to see a lot of you continue uh, with the other courses of the EMRA. Uh, as Jim said, um, we lost our chance uh, for sustainability a long time ago. Uh, we didn't want to accept it, but since 1970, our ecological footprint is above the capacity of the planet. And today we're way above the capacity of the planet. So uh, we started working on regeneration about 12 years ago, but it was hard because a lot of the people that were working were kind of isolated uh, we had a lot of interesting cases with permaculture and socially processes, cultural processes, but um, nothing that really could mainstream regeneration. And it wasn't about mainstreaming the theory of regeneration. We have enough beautiful books to read. Uh, we need to start doing it. And that's when we came to, to action. And that's why we're starting with Kate's course. I mean, of all the people I've, I've looked at that are doing uh, something different in economics, really moving beyond saying GDP is not a good measurement anymore, we need to do something else. Well, here's what actually can be done. And uh, we'll have in this program uh, other tremendous people like John Fullerton from Capital Institute who actually coined the word of regenerative economics and regenerative finance. So we, what we did here was actually, um, we collected collaborators from around the world that are actually bringing the top of the line of knowledge and experience. Uh, the best people around the world are joining here wanting to share their experience. And I think that's one fundamental point. The other one is in 2018, when we founded um, the Regenerate Costa Rica Initiative, which is a countrywide regeneration roadmap for other countries to be able to follow and get inspired. Um, we established also the Com Regenerative Communities Network with Capital Institute. And now a lot of other networks, the, the city network has also joined. So you, uh, the, the people who are going to do the master's uh, program, I hope a lot of you are, will have the opportunity to, to actually do regeneration in different places. You can choose around the world where you want to go and practice regeneration um, as part of this program. So we will be working with RCN, with a lot of other networks, with I think there are over 40 cities now uh, in, in, in the network. So we will structure be, beyond this academic component that's online a real hands-on experience. And I would love you to come and visit us here with Regenerate Costa Rica. It's, it's uh, incredible. We're working in, in the province that has the most attractions for tourists. Um, we're actually going to have facilities uh, just about five kilometers away from the beach, um, full with monkeys and other animals. So the idea is to work with the cultural dimension, the economic dimension, the political dimension, the spiritual dimension. It's not only about the environment. So the integration of holistic thinking, and that's what we've been designing in this program, the MRA, to be able to share um, how to put into action holistic approaches and reinvent education moving away from the reductionist disciplinary approaches to a real integrated transdisciplinary re bioregionally based educational process. So thank you for all for being here. You will enjoy Kate. Um, I heard her several years ago when she was on a tour around the world promoting her book. And I immediately said, wow, this is powerful. And I guess if you're all in this program, you probably have heard some of her TED talks and some other things a fabulous communicator and inspiring 
I mean, it's action. It's let's do it together. It's not telling a story about how to do it. It's actually, let's do it. So we've been really working hard. We've been actually in the process now for several sessions, downscaling the donor to the global south with people from Malaysia, India. So it's actually happening and way beyond um, our, our normal uh, horizon of work. So we're gonna go global. Uh, I used to call it, we're gonna make an army of regenerators, people who are actually active, having the planet regenerated together. We're gonna co-create solutions for regeneration. I now call it, um, we're gonna train, educate and share and co-create first responders for regeneration. So think of their jobs as first responders. We need to really shift the way we're going. So thank you all. And thank you, Kate, for being with us. And thank you, Jim, for really hosting this whole thing. And, and so many other people. Uh, Leslie has been tremendous in getting us organized. We're all so busy. And she's there. You know, um, Joel from GPM. I mean, it's just fabulous to get this team together. And I'm really looking forward to seeing a lot of you in my course, which is coming soon, and uh, throughout the program, because we need to really uh, work together on a better planet and give hope that we are capable. I'm not willing to sit and adapt to climate change. I think we still have the opportunity to build the world, world we want. So thank you and good luck. Thank you, Ed, so much. Uh, you've been a wonderful partner uh, and friend and instigator of regenerative action. I also, before we launch in everyone, I wanna invite Leslie Southwick Trask to say a few words. Leslie is the Chief Development Officer of Ubiquity. Uh, she came to our acquaintance uh, through Humanity Rising. Uh, she has really been the leader of the uh, MRA uh, coalition of groups and has just heartfully and ceaselessly worked over the last several weeks. We had a goal of 250 students. And as I said, uh, as of this morning, we pushed uh, beyond 300. And that was largely due to Leslie's uh, indefatigable energy and attention to detail. So Leslie, uh, thank you for everything you've done and uh, just welcome you to say a few words. Thank you. I know everybody's anxious for the main event, so I will be brief. I just want you to look around the screen. And if you wanna flip through the other screens that you can't see, you have just joined a global movement for regeneration. One of the things that we're doing with the MRA is that we honor the fact it's an academic offering with a credentialed uh, master's degree and its conclusion. But in truth, it's actually a movement. It's a community that you've joined. And we're gonna be putting in links throughout this uh, session of how you can come into the UBiverse, join the group through Donut Economics and become part of this intentional community for regeneration. And we do want to have you think about if you were think, you know, attending this course and thinking, do I really want to do a master's degree in this? Well, we're going to try and make it easy for you because we're looking at innovative scholarships, innovative um, pod designs of students uh, with shared tuition. We're even looking at financing the impact projects that you will be working on. So we're gonna make it as easy and as accessible as possible to equip you to be the first responders, as Ed just said, uh, in terms of regenerative action. We are as great as what we put into this. And I'm delighted to say that having spent hours and hours with our partners, I, I'm blown away as what Ed says, their, their capability, their intellect, their passion, and the edge that our partners are playing in regeneration. It just boggles my mind after every one of our coalition meetings, what these people are doing. And I just wanted to do a shout out to Marilyn, Marilyn Hamilton, who's in the crowd today, who's been the, one of the intrepid instigators of the MRA and Living, Living Cities and all her work, which you can find too in the MRA. So I'm gonna say thank you for being here. Contact me if you need any more insight about the uh, MRA itself. We are on a roll to changing the world. Back over to you, Jim. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, and thank you, everyone. And now uh, I just wanna uh, introduce Kate, who will then for the next four weeks, uh, each Wednesday, 
at this time will be conducting this course on the fundamentals of donut economics. Uh, I know that she needs no uh, introduction uh, to uh, any of you. I would just say one thing that there's an old saying that it, it takes genius to see simplicity. And I think with her book on donut economics, uh, Kate Rayworth has provided all of us with a simplicity of vision into the heart of one of the most complicated disciplines uh, in the human uh, academic uh, pantheon. We tend to think of economics as really complicated, but it's actually extraordinarily simple. It's as simple as a donut. <laughs> so Kate, welcome. And uh, I turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Jim. What, what an extraordinarily generous uh, introduction from you and from Ed and Leslie. I'm completely delighted to be here, uh, part of launching this Masters in Regenerative Action with Ubiquiti University. And I, I'm blown away by all the people sending their greetings online. It's just incredible from all over the world. So it's just that fabulous a fabulous sense of what we can do when we work together online like this. There's true global connection. So I'm going to share my screen and say I'm just really very honoured that Donut Economics is the launch course of this Masters. All the organisations that you can see there on the left hand side, incredible organisations that others have said, we see ourselves as part of big team work. This is big team work. No one person, organization or initiative can, can get it all. It takes a network of change makers. And I consider everybody who's enrolled in this course to be part of that network. So let's celebrate the big team that we make when we get together. So I'm gonna kick off today with this uh, Foundations of Donut Economics. Today, we're gonna to explore the donut. I'm going to give you dive into that simple concept. Next week, we'll talk about when the donut meets the city. The following week, we'll talk about can we do business in the donut? And then the last week, I'm so thrilled to bring some incredible change makers who I've had the honor of working with over the past couple of years who are putting these ideas really into action. So I'm gonna go for it. Week one, we're gonna explore the donut today. And I want to talk about the origins of where ideas come from because the donut may encapsulate simplicity, but of course it didn't just come from me at all. It's built on the ideas of many, many people, some of which you're aware of and some of which you're not aware of at all. And I want to explore where ideas come from because that tells us where they can go. So we're gonna talk about planetary boundaries, meeting social boundaries. We're gonna do a poll, can humanity get into the donut? I'm gonna ask you to take a stand on that question. And I'm gonna crowdsource your ideas towards Donut 3.0. And then I'll give a quick overview of donut economics and the other ideas in the book so that we can then dive forward into the following weeks. I just want to acknowledge that we are uh, over 250 people on this call. And that's an amazing number. It also means we can't have continual one-to-one -one interaction. So we're going to create as many spaces as we can for people to comment and use the chat box. But I just want to recognize that we won't be able to have the level of interaction that we'd love to have if we were all in the same room and having coffee between sections. I also want to acknowledge that many people on this call are joining not in their first language. Thank you for joining. And I aim to speak slowly enough, but I do sometimes get excited. I know it. So I'm going to keep myself slowly enough. But thank you to everybody having that international ability to speak other languages, because that's what enables us to connect across countries and cultures. So let's jump in. And I'm going to dive in with pictures. Donut economics is all about the pictures, and there's a reason for that. Pictures are incredibly powerful. Here's Ptolemy showing his vision of the known universe. He'd drawn Earth at the center with all the planets and the solar system around. Now, Copernicus here in the nice red jacket, he was watching the movement of the stars in the 1500s, and he knew that Ptolemy had it all wrong. But Copernicus did not dare to publish his alternative picture until he was on his deathbed because he knew that pictures were powerful. He knew that when he showed the world, actually, 
it's more like this, not Earth, but the sun at the center of the known universe. Earth is just one of many planets going around. He knew that that picture, simply rearranging the dots inside the circles, was a deep challenge to the power of the church. It questioned humanity's place in the universe. So it's incredible what chaos, rearranging a few concentric circles can unleash. And so we should pay great attention to the pictures that we use, teach and draw. And it drew me to thinking about the pictures that are shared in places like this, in departments of economics the world over. So many people study a little bit of economics and the pictures that they learn are the ones that stick with us longest. So what are the pictures at the heart of the 20th century economics that many of us on this course may well have been taught? There are three that I want to start with. The first image, I ask around the world, what's the first picture you remember learning in economics? And the picture is the same. It's the supply and demand curve, as if to say, welcome to the economy, here is the market. And we start with the market and we put price at the center of our vision. And anything that falls outside of that price contract is called an externality, which leaves us in the absurd and devastating situation that the death of the living world is called by economists an environmental externality. This alone is cause for transformation. What about the selfie, the portrait of humanity, who we tell ourselves we are? It is, of course, rational economic man. His picture is never drawn, but if it were, he'd have to look like this. He'd be a man standing alone with money in his hand, ego in his heart, a calculator in his head and nature at his feet. And this devastatingly simplistic vision of us is so dangerous because on being told that he is like us, we actually become more like him. We need to transform our understanding of who we are and who we can be if we're going to live well together, 10 billion of us on this planet this century. And then the goal. What is the goal of the economy? If we don't know the economy's goal, how on earth can we know what success looks like? The goal in mainstream economics is never drawn on the page. It doesn't need to be because it's spoken in every speech of politicians, in the economists, in, in economic journalism. And it is, of course, endless economic growth measured by GDP. In countries, even the UK where I'm sitting now, countries that are richer than nations have ever been before them believe that the success to their problems lies in yet more growth, endlessly through the ceiling without asking what happens next. I believe these pictures, these core concepts underlying 20th century economics have been profoundly influential in the worldview that we've lived by and it's led us into crises, repeated crises, whether it's financial meltdown of 2008, the ongoing era of climate and ecological breakdown, or the last year of COVID lockdown. These may be reported differently in the newspapers, but they have many things in common. They reveal just how deeply connected we are with each other and the rest of the living world. They reveal sharp inequalities of gender and race, of wealth and power, of global North and global South. And they arise from the very systems that we've created. I believe they all arise from systems that are, depend upon endless expansion. If you have a financial system that aims to endlessly expand, you will kick off a subprime mortgage market. If you have an energy and industrial system that endlessly draws on Earth's fossil fuels and materials, you will induce climate and ecological breakdown. If we have a system of human settlements that endlessly encroaches into wildlife areas, coupled with ever increasing global travel, we create perfect conditions for a global health pandemic. We need to transform our sense of the shape of progress. And we need to go beyond mere critique. It is far beyond time of just saying that's wrong. Here's a genius, Bucky Fuller, who said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And in the spirit of that, towards this new shape of progress, that is where I said, well, let's offer a donut. The goal here is to use Earth's resources radiating out from the center of this donut so that nobody is left in the hole in the middle of the donut, falling short on the essentials of life. But at the same time, we don't collectively overshoot the ecological ceiling and push so hard on Earth's life supporting systems that we kick our planetary home out of balance. The goal of the donut is to meet the needs of all within the means of the living planet. It's a safe and just space for humanity that depends upon a regenerative and distributive economy. 
In the simplest of terms, it aims to say, leave no one facing critical human deprivation, but do not create plant critical planetary degradation. And these boundaries, I believe, actually unleash creativity. They must unleash our creativity now. So that's the core concept. But where did it come from? Because it didn't come from me. It comes from a long lineage of ideas. And I want to dive into an exploration and a story of where these ideas come from. I want to tell a story that's not written in journal articles or in blogs that you can't read in the textbooks. But it really matters because we all create and co-create and evolve ideas. And as much as I'm telling where this has come from, I want it to inspire where this should go. This is an ongoing process of transformation of our mindsets. So from my point of view, where did this donut diagram come from? I realized that I've been deeply influenced by concepts that I had thought I'd forgotten and only later remembered. The first is Hazel Henderson's layer cake that she drew in the early 1980s and I encountered it in the 1990s. I love this diagram. I love this mother nature sitting under the love economy of unpaid care. With that on top, the underground economy, the public sector providing public goods, and then the private sector is icing on the cake. It's what everybody focuses on, it's what's visible, but it's underpinned by so much that was left invisible. I had this picture literally pinned to the wall next to my desk for years, just thinking, I love this picture. And, and there was probably something about a cake that means I ended up with a donut. This diagram from Herman Daly's work blew my mind when I first encountered it. The idea that once we may have had what we could call an empty world, where the economy was a small part of a much bigger ecosystem. And that made us feel that we could draw endlessly on Earth's resources and put our waste endlessly out. The sky is so big, the ocean so deep, the, the forest so great. Surely little humanity couldn't make a dent in this. And that's when the founding fathers of economics wrote their textbooks, came up with their ideas. No wonder they ignored the planet and called its destruction an externality. But we live in full world where our economy is banging into the edges of the ecosystem and we feel it and see it in the news every day. And surely this demands an utterly different economics. I was also profoundly struck by this diagram created by Friends of the Earth in the Netherlands in the 1990s when I first encountered it. I counted it around the year 2000. The idea that there's a limit to pressure we can put on planet Earth, but there's also a minimum resource use and that something in between is the space, this idea of boundaries. I remember seeing this picture and thinking that's clever, but there were no metrics, there were no specifics. I didn't know what to do with it. Like all of these other pictures, it went through my eyes, into my visual cortex, into the back of my head, which is where all pictures sit. And it sat there, probably waiting for years for it to have another purpose. It was at least then a decade for me before I saw this diagram. I saw this in 2010. I'd been on maternity leave, had twins, immersed in the unpaid care economy of childhood. And I came back to my job at Oxfam and somebody said, oh, this is one of the big ideas from the last year. And it had this massive impact on me. I felt it viscerally in my body and I couldn't name why. These Earth system scientists were saying, we believe there are nine life supporting systems, nine planetary boundaries that make Earth a human home. And that that green circle in the middle is a safe operating space for humanity, but we've overshot it. I remember sitting at my desk and thinking, this is the beginning of the rewriting of economics. Now, where did they get this from? They were drawing on this diagram, which is the last 100,000 years of life on Earth and Earth's temperature over that time. And they were noticing that over that time, the temperature on Earth has varied a lot, but then in the last 11 or 12,000 years, it's been that little bit warmer and far more stable. And they ringed this and they said, this is the Holocene era. What is it about the Holocene that keeps us in this space because this is the space in which all human civilizations have arisen. We discovered and created agriculture, we have thrived. We would be crazy to kick ourselves out of this. And that's how they came up with these nine life supporting systems that they believe are what hold earth in that stable state. I think when I was looking at this picture without realizing it, my visual cortex was recalling Hazel Henderson's layer cake. Actually, it was on the side of my desk. And I thought that green circle in the center, that's the layer of mother nature and it's getting squashed. It's like all the jam is coming out the side. It's getting so squashed by the human economy. I saw in my mind's eye, Herman Daly's diagram, 
We're not just banging into the corners of this circle. We're way overshooting it. And then this diagram from Friends of the Earth, I thought, well, if the Earth system scientists are telling us there's an outer limit of pressure we can put, that green circle, if we go to the center of that green circle, that's a place where humanity would be putting no pressure on the planet. We would be using no fossil fuels. We would be converting none of Earth's surface. We would be putting no fertilizers in the soil. We would be drawing no water from lakes and rivers. That's a place of death and destruction for billions of people if we go there overnight. So there must be an inner limit of resource use too. And I sketched on this scrappy little piece of paper at my desk, this shape inside, outside. You can see me scratching away saying, is this a useful concept? And I thought, yeah, it's a, a kind of a, a, a two-sided shape. Don't fall below, but don't overshoot. Now, I'll tell you the truth. The first thing I did with that, I thought, that's quite satisfying, but I put it in the bottom drawer of my desk because I thought, well, why is anybody else going to be interested in that? I didn't realize at the time the power of pictures. I was just doodling, but I kept finding myself in conversations where I said, you know what, that actually for this conversation, I have a picture I drew earlier and people say that is interesting. You should work on that. So then I drew it up in PowerPoint, really clunky, I know. I drew it up, there's the nine planetary boundaries around the outside, an environmental ceiling, a social floor, the safe and just operating space for humanity. It's no longer a circle, it's a donut. But I had a problem. The Earth system scientists of the world have come together and used their expert knowledge to define the nine planetary boundaries. Okay, I'm sitting at my desk in Oxfam and I know we should define the social boundaries, but who has the authority and the credibility to do that? You could take all human rights and put them there, but that would be a very, very, very long list. And the Earth system scientists had had the ingenious idea to limit it to nine. We might then be able to remember that and act on that. I was given a brilliant idea by a friend called Felix Dodds. He said, you know what? Next year is the Rio Plus 20 Conference on Sustainable Development happening in, in uh, 2012. All of the governments of the world are submitting their reports to that conference. Why don't you go through what all the governments are saying and see what social issues they're coming up with? And that's exactly what I did. I went through 86 submissions by the world's governments and underlined every single social issue that they mentioned. And I crowdsourced, so over anything that was mentioned by more than half of the submissions by governments became part of the social foundation. So it was crowdsourced from the world's governments and it came out looking like this. And this was the donut 1.0 that we launched in February, 2012. And I took to the Rio Plus 12 conference and it had huge resonance there. I was amazed by the number of people who said, this is how I've always thought about sustainable development. I've just never seen the picture before. And I could say to the world's governments, these are your values connected with the latest earth system science. But then in 2015, those governments came through with what they set out to do at that conference and they produced the sustainable development goals. They actually came up with their agreed set. And the Earth system scientists came with a new version of planetary boundaries. They kept the same nine. They said the last five years have confirmed these, but we've updated the science of where we think we are. And it's not good news. So I thought, well, I must update the donor. And by the way, when the governments have been producing the sustainable development goals, I'm told that in the last hours of negotiating those goals, the diagram of the donut was on the table next to them. They said, we, we put it there to keep our eye on the big picture. So the donut, help shape the SDGs and the SDGs then help shape Donut 2.0. So I crowdsourced all of the social issues from the sustainable development goals and put them in the center of the donut. So now they really do reflect the latest statement of the world's governments of the shared goals and the planetary boundaries are around the outside. Now we've come a long way here. We've come a long way from thinking that the shape of progress is an ever rising curve. And actually it suddenly looks more like dynamic balance. If I do it with my hands, it feels like a heartbeat, thriving in dynamic balance. But this is of course, not a new idea that we should represent well-being by a circle of dynamic balance. Across the world, indigenous cultures, modern and old have shown through their diagrams, images of well-being, of health, of prosperity, of flourishing that hold this shape. And it's actually the Western mindset, the Western culture that is really late to come to realize this. And to me, the question is, can we? Can we keep evolving and learn and, and learn from the depth of wisdom that's held in all of these concepts? 
So here's the donut concept and here's its visualization and the feel of its shape. Then the question is, how can we quantify it? Can we put metrics to it? Because metrics are powerful. They start to tell us where we are now. So to quantify the social foundation, I set out with the goal of saying, I want to find one or two indicators that will give us a sense of the proportion of people in the world who are critically deprived on each of these dimensions. This was before the world's governments had created the 169 indicators of the sustainable development goals. So the goals existed, but not the indicators. And you're always faced dilemmas when you're choosing indicators. Do you want academic precision or traction with people who understand it? What's the data available versus the data desired? Do you want indicators of processes in play or outcomes achieved? Do you want numbers or visual representation? Do you want to collect data that's subjective of how people say their lives are or how they are objective measured by somebody else? Do you want globally available data or locally relevant? Do you want a composite indicator or hold them visually together in a dashboard? Do you want data that's policy responsive that will show up in the short term if a policymaker does something or that shows long-term transformation? These dilemmas of data and indicators never go away. You have to make choices. But I chose this set of indicators for creating these uh, visualizations of the donut. Just to take one food, here's some of the dilemmas. This says from the FAO that 11% of the world's population are undernourished. Actually, what you'd really want to measure is the proportion of people who are malnourished, who don't have a nutritious diet, not just falling short on calories. I had long conversations with the World Health Organization. Do you have this data? No, it's coming, but it's not available. It's that tension between using what's desired, doesn't exist yet, and using what's available. On water, I use two measures. The proportion of people without access to improved drinking water, the proportion of people without access to improved sanitation. So some of them have one number, some of them have two. So you can dive in here and critique and update and challenge. It's an ongoing process of improving the data that we use and the metrics that we try to give ourselves a snapshot of the world. Moving to the planetary boundaries. This for me was much easier because the earth system scientists had already done it. They had quantified the planetary boundaries. And I said, I'm just going to take their expertise and bring this into the donut. And every time they update it, we'll update the donut. So for example, on the ecological ceiling, on climate change, it's set at 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But the actual performance of the state of the world is over 400 and worse now. So we see that overshoot. Some fall below the boundary, some are already in overshoot. Diving a bit deeper on the planetary boundaries, it's really important to recognize these boundaries are not tipping points. Now, I love this photograph. It's a, it's a crazy, crazy advertisement for a guy wearing some brilliant soundproof headphones. He's in an absurd situation because we know that he's about to go over that waterfall, but as far as he knows, he's fine. He's not yet gone over the tipping point, but he's way beyond the safety zone. And planetary boundaries aim to set a safety zone. They're like a sign in the river that says, go no further, big waterfall ahead. We don't know exactly where it is, but we know it's out there. He's way past it. So the planetary boundaries and that green space says within this green space, you are in the safe zone. Now, once you go into yellow, you have gone beyond the safety zone and we don't yet know where that danger lies, where that tipping point is. What's more, not all of the planetary boundaries have the same kind of characteristics. So here's the donut and uh, Johan Rockström himself described these to me in a, a way that I found very helpful. I've labeled them here. Three of these planetary boundaries are what we call global processes. They're well mixed. Carbon dioxide released anywhere, mixes in the atmosphere. Ozone layer depletion, ocean acidification, the dissolving of carbon dioxide in the ocean. And they believe there are indeed global thresholds, global tipping points that we could tip over like a waterfall. But for the other ones, these alien processes of air pollution and chemical pollution and the four locally aggregating processes, they happen locally, but across the world, might their effects might aggregate. They fall on a more gradual curve. There's no sudden cut. There's no sudden cut at the global scale, but there may be locally. But of course, these all interact. And the interactions are profound and complex and humanity is only just at the beginning of understanding the deep interconnections of Earth's life supporting systems, which is another reason to use precaution and don't go beyond those points. So you can take the social foundation and its metrics. You can add the ecological ceiling of planetary boundaries and its metrics. And when you put them together, you get this. 
what I call humanity selfie. It's the portrait of state of humanity and the, our living planet now. We're the first generation to see this. And it means that the economic theories from the past and the government policies from the past and the business models and the community actions from the past won't help us solve this because they never saw this. And this is what not what they were invented for. We need to come up with new theories and policies and business models and actions of our own. Can we do it? And now I want to ask you this question indeed. Can we do it? Can humanity turn this story around? Can we be the generation that actually begins to reverse this, to regenerate the living planet, to regenerate humanity so that we come back within and meet the needs of all within the means of the living planet for the first time? And so we're actually going to do this. Now, if we were together in a room, it would have to be a pretty big room today. I would say, let's play this game I call Take a Stand. And I invite any one of you to do this in any community group that you find yourself in, in a room, clear some space. Okay, here's the question. You now understand the concept of the donut. Can humanity get into the donut by 2050? And I'd say to you, if you think, yes, we can, go and stand in that corner of the room. And if you think, no, we can't, go and stand in that opposite corner. Somebody's got their microphone on. If they could turn it off, it would really help because it's rustling a lot at the moment. If you think, well, whether or not we can, we should aim for the donut, go and stand in that corner. And whether or not we can, we should aim for something else, go and stand in the fourth corner. So here's the challenge. Can we live in the donut? And I'm gonna ask Richard now to pose the poll that we're gonna invite you to take. We can't play this room in, game in the room, but we can play it online. So you will have a choice now. Take a stand. I know it's not easy, but take a stand. Go for one of these answers. Which one do you feel today? And once everybody has voted on this, we will have a look at our results. So I hope everyone's voting. Richard, you're gathering the answers. It's a wonderful game to play in the room, as you can imagine, because people can't believe where their friends are standing. What are you doing over there? How can you be standing there? And we're amazed to discover each other's worldviews and each other's optimism or pessimism or realism about the world. So take your stand in the online poll. And Richard, when you think we've got plenty of those answers in, I'm going to ask you to post the responses that we've got. We've got about another 20 and I'll, okay. I'll post it. Keep going, folks. Come on, take a stand. You can change your mind tomorrow. You can even change your mind. When we play this in, in a room, we invite people to cross the floor. We encourage people to persuade people. Don't stand there. Come here. Change your mind. What does it take to change your mind? What would it take to change somebody else's mind? How would you persuade them? With data? With examples? With vision? What moves you? We're all moved in different ways. So let's see where this group comes out. Oops. Oh, here we go. Look at that. That is, that's extraordinary. So we've got around just over a third of people saying, yes, we can, we can do this. And two thirds of people saying whether or not we can, we should aim for it. And a tiny proportion of saying whether or not we can, we should aim for something else. But nobody on this call has said, no, we can't. Well, that's extraordinary. And maybe it tells us something about who's chosen to come onto this call. Of course, there's self-selection into this group. I'm gonna ask people who said, yes, we can. Can some people who posted that, can you write in the chat box why you think, yes, we can? It'd be great to see some of those answers appearing now in the chat box. Why would, and if you were standing in the room and saying, yes, we can, here's why we can, just write in the chat box. Why do you think we can do this? The human spirit at its best in action. Uh, for the sake of the seventh generation, we must. Lovely. Fantastic. We have the potential, but whether or not we will. Yep. We have the numbers to aim for. We, un we overestimate what we can do in a year, but we underestimate what we can do in 20. I love that. It's so true. We have the knowledge. We have the tools. It's very simple. It depends on each one of us. Fantastic. And I'm going to ask anybody who says whether or not we think we can, we should aim for it. And that's an interesting question. So there's, that's holding of a doubt. 
But why do you think we should aim for this anyway, even if we're not convinced we can make it? Could somebody who's been po two thirds of you posted that, that reflection on even if we hold a doubt, we should aim for it. Why? Why does it help us to aim for something even if we don't know that we can get at it? It creates momentum. The goalposts matter. Yeah, goals. Having goals, having a vision, having a concrete assignment, something to aim for. Perfectionism doesn't help. Hope. Because we'd be going in the right direction, right? Rather than sitting around saying, but is that exactly the right goal? Let's just get going because we already know this is direction we need to go in. Less people will suffer. Very pragmatic. Fantastic. Okay. And then I would love to ask the 2% of people who said we should aim for something else. Brilliant. Do you want to just share now something else that we should aim for? Whether it's a concrete idea, whether it's a vision, whether it's a word, something very specific. Does anybody else have something else? Go for diversity of approaches, having local impact on lo global, having local impact on local communities. Can some integrated impact of other communities trying different methods? I love that. None of us know what's going to work. And actually, that's the first principle of donut economics. We've never pushed or encouraged or pressured or lobbied or asked anybody to use the donut because people will find different tools useful in different places. That's what I love about being part of this Masters in Regenerative Action. There are many ideas and many will work in different places. If you could, if, thanks. Many different tools will work in different places and let's adapt and use a multiplicity of ideas and see what takes us there. Fabulous. We must look for happiness. Think global, act local, trust the process. Love it. Okay. Wonderful, folks. Thank you. That's brilliant to see this online poll. Right. I'm going to put you more to work now. So we've done the poll. Now, as I told you, the donut is an evolving concept. Don't stand still because the world is moving fast. And if we want our ideas to be relevant, they've got to keep up with our knowledge, with our aspiration and with what we can now see. So the core concept of the donut, as I said at the beginning, is leave no one facing critical human deprivation below the social foundation but don't create critical planetary degradation above the ecological ceiling. Version 1.0 in 2012 looked like this. I redrew it after the SDGs and the update of planetary boundaries and it came out looking like this. Now, what if I was to tell you that maybe it's time for Donut 3.0? Five years on again, maybe it's time to recreate this idea. What then should change? How could this evolve? Keeping the core concept, but what could be different? And that's what I'm going to invite you to do, to go into breakout rooms and discuss. So propose some changes for Donut 3.0, because this is a real project, by the way. So if you have any ideas, how should it change conceptually or the dimensions that are included? Or how could it change visually? Do you like the colours or the drawing or something doesn't work or it's not easy to understand or the narrative, the story of what it's about? Do you think some of the indicators or the data should change, the source of indicators or who's gathering the data or anything else you want to bring? Now, I'm inviting you not to bring critique of what's wrong. That might be a great place to start. What's wrong? I don't like this. That doesn't work. But the challenge is to say, OK, then what? Because critique is easy, but proposition is so much more constructive and useful and valuable. And who knows, you might actually come up with an idea that then becomes part of Donut 3.0. So what we're going to do is Richard is going to now put in the chat box a link to a Google Doc. And if everybody clicks on that, it will take you here. This Google Doc will open up and you'll see 45 identical pages with this framework on that I just presented to you. Now, if you are in, when you go into a breakout room, because Richard will give you a breakout link, look for the number that you're in. If you happen to be in breakout room nine, go to this slide, slide nine, and everybody in that breakout room will converge there with you and you'll all be working together on the same slide. So as a group, you could use this. Somebody could share their screen, that sometimes helps if you want as a group, or you can um, all work on it individually. As a group, add your proposals in here. Everybody can type in it, or you could say one or two people in the group, you type, you do the typing, capture the group's ideas and make sure you're listening to what everybody's saying. You've got 20 minutes as a group to come up with some great ideas. And then when we come back in plenary, I'm going to just ask again in the chat box, I'm going to ask people to share back your best ideas 
from each of the quadrants. So we won't be able to take in everything, but share back the ones you think this really should be in Donut 3.0. And all of these slides will be saved on the Ubiquiti University website. So they'll be all accessible to everybody afterwards. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. And I believe Richard is going to now give us chat breakout rooms to go into. You've got 20 minutes. Okay, <clears throat> I see that everybody's coming back for the breakout rooms, amazing. So, I hope you've had good discussions. The first thing I'm going to ask actually is, was that the right amount of time? We, we This is the first session we're running in this whole masters and in this course. If you have a view, you want to write the chat box, yeah, that was just the right amount of time or actually we need longer or less. It'd be great to hear that right now. Oh, lots of opinions coming. Hang on. This is great. There were some issues with typing. Not everybody could type on the... Okay, I'm sorry document. to hear some people are having trouble with typing. Yeah, that was our our challenge, uh, Kate. No. We, could, we couldn't access it. Ah, and yet some people could. That's yeah. curious. Okay, this is great feedback. Thank you, everybody. Several people yeah. say five minutes I more, could. maybe. I believe Google. I was just telling why the slides yeah. went off. Okay, maybe there were too many people. Ah, oh, maybe we had too many people accessing the one document at the same time. That might be what's going on. It's true. I have never done this exercise with three hundred people before. Um, we're 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 blowing a fuse on the system for for all great reasons. But thank you. That's really really good feedback. So maybe next time we'll do 25 minutes. Uh, thanks folks, excellent to have this feedback. Okay, let's dive into what- uh, just, just, just briefly, if I might, this is Ian. Uh, what we did, we actually created a Word document with, the, with, the, with the, the, the four quadrants and then we've captured the notes. I've got that as a screen grab, but the way the chat box is working in this Zoom call, I can't just drop it in there. Right. Okay, got it. Or maybe um, if there's a way you could add it to that Google Doc or something, if we could keep it on record, that'd be great. Thanks, Ian. Yep. Okay, Pleasure. so what we're going to do, again, because there's so many people, it would be lovely to hear back from each of the groups, but that would literally take us through to the next three hours. Um, so what I'm going to do, ask folks again, we're going to use the chat box. I'm going to ask you to pull out the most powerful ideas. So we can, we can all see the chat box, it goes streaming past. So decide which of your ideas that you're going to share here, the ones that you really think if there's going to be a new donut, they should be in it. Okay, so I'm going to ask, first of all, let's just start with ideas for the visual and the narrative. So if you had a really great idea for something visual that should be changing here, or something around the narrative that should be changing here. Anyone from your group? It'd be great to hear that. Um, do you want us to talk or to write? Sorry. Uh, to write, I'm afraid. Otherwise, it would be so nice to hear voices, but then there'll be 300 voices. So if, some, <laughs> if you could if you could write in the chat box, add explicit examples of what the safe zone looks like. That's a great point because what the donut currently does is highlight where we don't want to be. It tells us about overshoot of the planet. It tells about people falling short. What it doesn't actually name clearly is what it's like to be in that green space. Show the interrelations. I love that point. So many people, when they first see the donut, they say, yeah, but everything's in its own box. And it's all interconnected. And that's absolutely true. If when you see the donut, the first thing you want to do is pick up a pen and draw so many lines on it that it turns into a bowl of spaghetti, you've absolutely got the idea. Everything is interconnected. But of course, if we try to draw on top of this diagram how everything is interconnected, it would all be so utterly interconnected, it would be impossible to see. So I think of it as layer upon layer. We're actually only just beginning to understand how everything is interconnected. Um, so we're at the beginnings of doing that. Add the SDG icons. Yeah, maybe you could ask the SDG icons or, inter or indeed add icons instead of just words. Make it three-dimensional, Martha says. I think three-dimensional is a great 
great in invitation. So many people have said, okay, there's two dimensions, but donuts are three dimensions. So what's the third dimension? And to me, actually, that is the, the big question. And I invite everybody to meditate on that. If this had a third dimension of uplift, what would it be? Some traditional economists would say, well, there's economic growth. And I'd say, All right, are we really gonna give away the third dimension just to more GDP rising? What could that be? What would that third dimension be? It's a great question. Include age and gender breakdown in indicators. And I would say include racial breakdown, include different, all sorts of different identity breakdowns that are important. Yes, of course, if you were to zoom in on any one of these quadrants, then you'd precisely want to be including those breakdowns by identity to show that inequalities can be horizontal, that they happen across group identities. And it's really important to recognize those because they can be structural inequalities. Add an indicator on tree forest and tree planting. Interesting, so the, the planetary boundary scientists, I think would say that's connected to land conversion. The extent to which land is being converted from its original coverage and the, and the indicator they use there is forest coverage. Um, Add a third dimension, the quality of life, dreams, feelings, connections. Absolutely. Actually, sometimes when I draw this, I draw it flat. In fact, I put a donut here, if you can see me in a little box. I, I put the donut flat and I think of a spiral rising. And I sometimes think of um, Manfred Max Neef has these beautiful fundamental human needs, which are about subsistence, but also connection, belonging, creativity, freedom. And it's as if those, I think, are what can rise. The donut yeah. does not create well-being for humanity. The donut, in a sense, creates the preconditions of well-being for humanity, but that well-being itself is much more intangible in experience. Okay, I'm going to invite next, this is a wonderful stream of ideas, I'm going to invite next people to, if you've got any uh, indicator or data changes that you think there's the, it's the wrong data or, or you, you, there's so much dead, better piece of indicator or data that we could be adding in here. Someone said a life boy rather than a donut. Yes, that's a, that's a, Good point, it's a long story. We can tell that story, but why is it called a donut? Data is too slow. We need a crowdsourced aggregator. That's a great comment. And actually the world, we are blessed with data like never before, right? The vast majority of people have an, an internet connected phone in their hands. We can actually crowdsource people's generated data in real time, it's happening. If the internet of things is going to be useful for anything let's make it useful for this that we could actually have in real time a visualization of how humanity is rising or falling is recovering and regenerating or still degenerating an indicator about solidarity i love that so so these as i'm going to comment on the point somebody said an indicator about solidarity and art and culture there's a really good reason why these are missing and it's because i crowdsourced the social foundation from the world's governments right when they came out with the SDGs, I thought, well, the world's governments have agreed this. That's an incredibly credible, internationally agreed source. And it means that I can present this to any government. In fact, I was invited to present the donut to the UN General Assembly. And it meant I could stand in front of them and say, whose values are here? They're yours. This came from you. So these are your values I'm reflecting back to you. That's the strength of sourcing the SDG, the, the center of the donut from the SDGs. Now, the downside of that is that the world's governments didn't get everything. They talked about gender equality. They didn't specifically name racial equality. They didn't talk about art and culture. They didn't talk about community and solidarity. And here's why. The SDGs actually came out of the Millennium Development Goals. And the Millennium Development Goals came out of the covenants of human rights. And human rights coming out in the late 1940s actually were around some very specified individual rights. And so I think there's a legacy written into human rights, to the MDGs, to the Sustainable Development Goals, which overly focuses on individual claims. And you could say, do you have enough food and water and housing and education and income and work? These could all be claimed individually, except, of course, the ones that are in relation, gender equality, social equity, political voice, peace and justice. These are in relation to each other. But there's no mention here of community, solidarity. And connection and I also agree that it needs to be added spiritual well-being and social well-being and that's something that one could crowdsource literally you have to ask people what is your state of well-being that's subjective data that we could possibly bring in here so many so many wonderful ideas coming through here thank you bowling alone metrics yeah to what extent are people now bowling alone 
uh, as, as opposed to bowling in community, spending time in community. So many metrics we could bring in here. OK, I'm going to ask if anybody wants to raise anything conceptual that hasn't already come up here. And I'm going to invite, because now I'm opening the box, anything, the lids off, anything else, any wild, wild ideas that you think that should be added. Somebody says add a subtitle that explains what the donut is about. Hey, if anyone wants to come up with a subtitle, please do. I would, I, you know, it's it's always an interesting idea. How do you explain what this thing is? I say it might be a safe and just space for humanity. It's a compass that aims to meet the needs of all within the means of the living planet. If anybody on this conversation can come up with a better subtitle, that would be just brilliant. The tastiest economic you'll ever enjoy. Yeah, the only donut that actually turns out to be good for us. That's what I often say. So how to show the dynamics and the pace, thank you. This is static. This is a snapshot. And actually this is a snapshot based on data from around 2014, 2015. What matters is the direction we're going in. So yes, the next thing we want to do is show the dynamics. We could show, we could show these same red wedges, but you could add an indicator that shows and it's getting worse or and it's coming better. But over time, I mean, imagine if we gather enough data and the world collects enough data that over time we could show this thing moving. Isn't that what we want to see? What's going up? What's going down? Are we indeed coming back within and eliminating that human shortfall? That is totally possible as a project, as the world's data gets better, which it's going to do. This is going to become more doable. I'm just really enjoying reading all of these ideas. Moving by region, by culture. In fact, I think you could layer over so many cultural variations on this. And that's, of course, what people have started doing, taking it and making it for their own culture. When people downscale the donut to a, a city or a community, we say, go ahead, rename, relabel what, what, what makes you thrive, what really matters to you, add things in. In fact, the first, the first downscaling of the donut happened in a neighborhood in um, uh, KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. Uh, Coxstad and Franklin neighborhood and they said the youth of the neighborhood added in fun they added in a segment for fun they said hey transforming your economy has to be fun I thought that was just brilliant okay I'm loving all these these ideas that are coming in please keep them coming this is how ideas change right this is how ideas keep evolving and we are indeed planning on making an evolution and we will crowdsource it and if you're interested in actually being part of that if you sign up to the newsletter of DonutEconomics.org, Donut Economics Action Lab, you would find out when we launch that project and when we say we want to crowdsource the best ideas. But this is phenomenal ideas coming through here. Thank you. I'm going to move us along. I'm going to take us now towards the final ride of today. We've got another half hour together and actually a little bit more than that, which is great. And I just want us to pull back. We've, we've had such a fantastic exploration of whether or not we can get at the donut and how we want to evolve this donut. Think of it continually as evolving because it is. And I'm going to pull us back to here. Welcome to the first economics lecture in a university somewhere in the world. And we know that for decades past, I know how this first lecture is going to begin because it's the same way that it's always begun. Here's the supply and demand curve. We're going to teach you how to derive supply and demand. We're going to talk about the market and how prices bring markets into balance. And now we're suddenly talking about price like we always did. And for me, this is a what if moment. What if instead of putting that up on the board, the professor were to say, here's the donut. What kind of economy would bring us into the donut? Because after all, economics, when we go back to the ancient Greek, it means the art of household management. Well, when we take that seriously, what is the household? It is obviously our planetary household. Xenophon began economics at the level of a literal household, his estate. And then he took it to the level of a city. Adam Smith took it to the level of a nation and asked what makes one nation thrive and another fall. And it is our duty to raise our sights again and take it from the household to the city, to the state, to the nation, to the planetary household. So the household is the whole, the whole planet. And those are our planetary boundaries. And then if, if economics is the art of my, my household management, in, for whose interests? 
the interests of all humanity and the living world and all those who are living here with us. And how do we do that? And the social foundation specifies the needs of humanity. And I think one of the donut, things the donut needs to do better is specify the needs of all other living beings, which I think it doesn't do well enough yet. If we began an economics degree anywhere in the world like this, with this is the first slide, we know that every single conversation, every single lecture that follows on would be different. And guess what? <laughs> the Masters of Regenerative Action actually is that degree. It might not be an economics degree. It's bigger than that. It's about regenerative action. But we're starting here with the concept of the donut. And I want to just lead us into where, from donut economics point of view, where would we go next? If you start with a donut, what kind of concepts, what kind of images and understandings of the economy would we then follow on with? And the first diagram that I draw after introducing the donut is never supply and demand. It's this, I call it the big picture of the economy, the embedded economy diagram. It draws on ecological economics, commons thinking, feminist economics. And what it aims to do is to say, listen, it's obvious the economy is a social construct. It's embedded in society because it's just made up of relationships between humans that we have invented. And the beautiful thing about that is that we can also reinvent them. And society is embedded in the rest of the living world. Humanity draws on Earth's materials and puts out a stream of waste into the living world. Think of Herman Daly's diagram. And we need to make sure that square is not banging on the edge of the circle, but it's thriving within. And we are bathed in a river of solar energy, without which nothing. Thank you, Sun. So there's the big picture. But then let's dive in and look inside the economy. And in the framing of donut economics, we, we then to simplify it and say, look, there are four fundamental ways that humanity organizes to meet for our wants and needs. And some of the ways we can call of it is market, household, state, and the commons. So mainstream economics says, welcome to it. the economy, here's supply and demand. What it actually does is bring us straight to the market. And then who it tells us we are in that relationship is that you are a consumer or you're a producer. And in the world of production, are you labor earning a wage or are you capital earning a rent? It costs us as rational economic man. It tells us that the skills and the traits we value are competition and self-interest and knowing the price of everything and ever calculating and optimizing and being efficient. Of course, even in the space of markets, this is not the way that humanity can or should interact. But the market, is only one way we interact with each other. Then economics will say, well, of course, the market doesn't provide everything we need, no way, because markets are incredibly powerful. There's just two flaws. One, they only work for those who could pay, the rest they ignore, and they only value what's uh, priced, the rest they exploit. So those are pretty major flaws. Now, we also need the state. And in relation to the state stepping in and providing public goods and setting the regulations for all, then we also have a set of identities. We may be a public servant, a teacher, a doctor, a civil servant. You may be a resident of a nation or a city. You may be voter, a protester. All of these are crucial roles that we can play in relation to the state. 20th century economics obsessed with the ideological boxing match between these two. Are you a free market, laissez-faire capitalist, or are you a state-loving socialist? And that boxing match back and forth between the two, between the US and the USSR, measuring GDP, right? Everything that happens in that band is measuring GDP, captured there, monetized, but it completely misses two fundamental sources of our well-being. The household, where we all begin every day, where you may be a parent, a partner, a relative, a child, a neighbor, a carer. The subsistence economy, the caring economy, the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping that goes into raising the kids and doing it all again tomorrow. That is what gets labor fresh and ready to show up in the market, but it's completely missing from the picture. It took feminist economists to bring this in in the 1970s, the work of Marilyn Waring, Nancy Fulbright, many others following. Peggy Antrobus has done some phenomenal work in this area too. So the household, but also the commons. So neglected, many people, even economists say the commons, what's that? 
It took Ellen Ostrom, the political scientist, to make us remind us of the commons. The commons where people come together, not through the market or the state, but as a community, as a group of people who want to co-create something that they value. It could be a garden on the corner of your neighborhood block. It could be Wikipedia on the World Wide Web. It may have no money changing hands, but it's something that people res uh, steward together as a resource. And Ostrom made us realize that the tragedy of the commons that we were told in the 1960s may actually turn out to be a triumph. When people come together, they can be volunteers and sharers and co-creators and stewards, creating a set of shared rules and practices that they will follow to create value that otherwise would not exist. So all of these are essential roles we could play. And then you can see there are financial flows in the middle here. And of course, finance should be in service to these forms of economy. And my friend and ally, Hunter Lovins, always talks about making finance in service to the economy in service to life. So how could we redesign finance so that it's actually in service to enabling all of these forms? So these multiple identities, they've become so clear over the last year. If there's one thing that COVID has taught us is that when market spaces are physically shut down due to the need for physical distancing, first of all, the state steps in and everybody suddenly remembers who the essential workers are, whose work is essential, what is essential in life. But also the household steps in the caring, the childcare, the homeschooling, the tending to the ill, the looking after the neighbors, sometimes with joy. And sometimes it's been a great, a place of intensity and domestic violence because of the pressure that's been put on the household over this past year. And the commons step in, connecting as a street. Are you okay? Connecting as a community, let's run a food bank, let's volunteer, let's look out for each other. And one of the things that many people worldwide say they don't want to lose after COVID crisis, passes is that sense of a we that sense of solidarity that people were saying was missing from the social foundation how can we bring it in how can we keep it in our economies how can we structure market and state and household and commons and respect the space for all of these identities because we all weave in and out of these every day we all inhabit these identities in our economic and social lives so just to celebrate that i want to invite everybody to share in the chat box some of the many social and economic roles that you weave together in your life. It could be roles that you've played today. You could have been a parent, a teacher, somebody shopping, working, caring, volunteering, just in this very day, right in the chat box. And let's just have a lovely cascade of humanity experiencing all these roles in our lives. Parent, teacher, researcher, carer, mediator, coach, street gardens, fantastic volunteering, co-creating, amazing mother activist exactly we all weave these this is part of our lives and yet we so rarely name it and naming is powerful words are powerful pictures are powerful let's let's commit to naming these roles and recognizing them as all essential part of our identities a healthy economy is one that will enable us all to move in all of these spaces loving all of this dog parent <laughs> fantastic that's connecting with the rest of the living world cookie baker dog walker activist volunteer mentor snake rescuer wow we got some good humanity on this call stepmom home member volunteer dreamer thank you partnership are fantastic okay keep on sharing i'm going to move us on to the next idea that i want to share before we end today which is how can we get into the donor? We've seen this overshoot and shortfall. We need to turn this around. As Ed said to Jim, when they first met, it's not enough to be sustainable. We need to regenerate, mate. So we need to turn around the dynamics of our global economy. And I think there are two fundamental dynamics that we need to bring into practice at the level of the global economy, at the level of nations and cities in businesses and communities in neighborhoods, two dynamics that we need to transform. One, we need to be become regenerative by design and distributive by design. Let me say a little bit more about that. We have inherited linear degenerative industrial structures. We take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while, and then we throw it away. And that is what has been pushing us over planetary boundaries. That is how we run down Earth's life supporting systems, taking again and again from the timber, from the hills, Earth's materials, and then throwing our waste again and again into the atmosphere, into the lakes and rivers and into the soil. 
it's time to transform this. We need to bend those arrows around so we create a circular or a cyclical economy that regenerates life's sources so that we work with and within the cycles of the living world, so that we come back within them, so there's repair and restoration to be done, so that we belong again on planet Earth. Some examples of those, <clears throat> just a few examples from cities this time. So Oslo has gone car free in the city centre. Get rid of the fossil fuel transport. Let's have trams and bicycles and people walking and actually let's bring humanity. So even though they're working on getting rid of fossil fuels and tackling climate change, guess what? It ticks every box in the social foundation. Space for people, connection, community, solidarity. Circular construction in Amsterdam. Amsterdam has committed to be 100% circular economy by 2050, even though nobody yet knows what that means. It's brilliant, it's a moonshot far too far away, let's be 50% circular by 2030. And that means let's write circularity into building regulations and construction now. So this district in Amsterdam called Bijkschlotterham, Dutch colleagues on the call, I know you'll laugh at my pronunciation. Bijkschlotterham is an experimental circular living lab in Amsterdam where everything that happens there has to be part of circular design because this has to be learned, experimented, succeed and fail, but it's all learning. How can you use materials that have been reused and how can you use them so that they'll be used again and again, repurposed, recreated, refurbished, revalued. And then the sponge city, the concept of cities that are recognizing that water is not something to be held outside, to concrete over, to block off, because that ain't gonna work, especially in an era of climate change. Recognize that the city has an ecosystem and must act like a sponge. The city Kunli in China has created a water park on the edge of the city. In the dry season, it's an amazing water park for people to travel through. In the wet season, it becomes a floodland, absorbing the water from the city. And then Medellin in Colombia. The river in this city used to be treated as a very handy industrial sewer, carrying away all that waste that humanity is making. And then they recognized that the city is part of the ecosystem in which it's placed. The river is life and the water is life. So let's restore that and bring people back to the river again, create parks around the river and reconnect humanity with the nature in our city. So those are just some examples of regenerative by design, but also We've inherited economies that are divisive by design, through laws and regulations, through histories of colonialism, through ownership, through privilege. They tend to capture value and opportunity in the hands of a few. This is certainly true at the global level. Over the past decade, the number of billionaires in the world has doubled from 1,000 billionaires to 2,000 billionaires, and it's risen even more in the COVID crisis. But we know within every nation, there are structures that drive value and opportunity into the hands of a few. There's no way we can get the whole of humanity out of the hole in the middle of the donut in a world that's deeply unequal because those with wealth will be continue to overshoot and those without will continue to fall short. The only way to rebalance that is to create a far more equitable world. So we need to move from divisive design to distributive design. The dynamics of our economies need to be distributive so that value and opportunity and power are shared far more equitably with all who co-create it. And that turns out to be everybody. Some examples from places that are actually aiming to practice distributive design. In the city of Preston, one of the UK's top exports at the moment is the impressive, inspirational transformation that's happening in Preston. Preston was gonna have a massive shopping center built they were believing that somebody was coming out from the outside with incoming investment was going to rejuvenate the city. And then it got cancelled. The money never came. They realised nobody was coming to rescue them. And so Matthew Brown, a councillor in Preston, said, right, if nobody's come from the outside, we're going to have to use what we've got here. We've got institutions in this city that are called anchor institutions because they're anchored here. We've got city administration, schools, hospitals, universities, museums. So how are we using the money to buy all the goods and services that we need every day? What if we use that procurement power to buy locally, to buy small scale, to buy from firms that are owned by their employees or cooperatively, to buy from enterprises that are committed to distributive design themselves? And this is part of what's known as community wealth building. And through this, Preston is reinvesting and regenerating its own city from within. Let me turn to Vienna a city where more than 60% of people in that city live in housing that is social housing. 
It's affordable. It's owned by the city or city run cooperatives. Why? Because Vienna decided a long time ago that housing is a human right so that that land and housing should be owned by the city. And that makes it affordable. It's high quality, it's city center, it's normal. It's so different to the story that we all know in so many other cities where housing is incredibly expensive, owned by a few people who often don't live in the city at all and treat housing not as a human right, but as a, uh, an investment luxury that they can reap a return from and take that rent. Utterly different ownership creates utterly different dynamics. The city of Seattle in the US was one of the very first to say, we're gonna pay a living wage, $15 an hour. People laughed and said, if you pay $15 an hour, no one will be able to afford to go to restaurants anymore. It turned out that even the wait staff in restaurants could now afford to go to restaurants because they were being paid well enough. Cities like Stockton in California have trialed the universal basic income. These are experiments that in one place show that it can be done. It's not a laughing stock, it's actually a possible future. And these can then spread. And then let's end with the city of Bogota in Colombia. Public space given over to cars, why would you do that? Let's give it over to a park, turning a car park into a people's park a space for community and that solidarity and art and culture and connection that we want to see in the social foundation. A space for people to meet in the neighborhood, people like themselves and people not like themselves. And that's what makes you say, I belong here and I live here and I like it here. So those are some examples of distributed by design and there's gonna be so many more coming in future weeks. So let me just pull back. We began with 20th century economics, with supply and demand, with rational economic man and the goal of endless growth. And I hope in this process and in this whole course, we are debunking this because that is not where we want to start. Let's start with the whole economy embedded in society in the living world, recognizing that we of humanity, we are the most social of all mammals and we are deeply interconnected. And the goal is for all people to thrive in the donut.